Here at Johns Hopkins Medicine, known for groundbreaking research, teaching, and medical care. Welcome to Facebook Live from Johns Hopkins Medicine. I'm Elizabeth Tracy. And I'm Sammy Tafaha. I'm a plastic surgeon here at Johns Hopkins, specializing in hand and upper extremity surgery. And I have a particular interest in treating disorders affecting the peripheral nervous system. And you've already, thank you first of all so much for joining me today. And you've already introduced a term that might be a little bit confusing. So I'm hoping that you'll define it when you talk about the peripheral nervous system. What does that mean? Yeah, absolutely. So we break the nervous system down into the central and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system involves the brain and the spinal cord. And the peripheral nervous system you can think of as the circuitry that connects the central nervous system to the muscle and the skin and everything else in our body, really. And talk to me about the function of the peripheral nervous system. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so the peripheral nervous system is a relay uh, system, and it basically relays signals from the central nervous system to our body and back. So when we want to move a body part, a signal is sent from the brain and spinal cord through the peripheral nervous system to our muscle, and that activates motion. And likewise, it also relays signals back from the sensory organs in our skin and other tissues through the peripheral nervous system back to the brain so that we can perceive and sense and interact with our environment. What are the range of things that can happen to the peripheral nervous system such that repairs needed? So there are a number of different uh, pathologies that can affect the peripheral nervous system. The main reason why you would need to have a peripheral nerve repaired is trauma. You know, when uh, these peripheral nerves travel all through our body, and so when we have trauma to a body part, it's not uncommon for a peripheral nerve to be involved. And uh, depending on the distribution of that peripheral nerve, you'll have some, some amount of paralysis and numbness, and uh, that's really the issue that we try to, try to uh, address, and we try to restore those functions through our surgeries. Of course, I have to ask, how does a plastic surgeon get involved in repair of peripheral nerves? You know, that's a fantastic question. Peripheral nerves are kind of this uh, orphan, peripheral nerve surgeons, this orphan subspecialty that floats around amongst a number of different uh, surgical specialties, including neurosurgery, orthopedic surgery, plastic surgery and uh, ENT surgery, and really all of the surgical subspecialties have some uh, involvement in peripheral nerves, but uh, you know, there are some of us who, for whatever reason, take a special interest in it and really dive deep into it, and um, uh, it's actually, uh, I would say, plastic surgery is one of the, um, one of the few specialties that really has a, uh, plays a prominent role in peripheral nerve surgery. Well, it sounds like then you said deep dive that it's great to have your expertise for people who have the unfortunate experience of having those kinds of injuries. How often does this happen? Um, you know, the, uh, the specific numbers I don't have off the top of my head, um, but uh, like I said, it's not uncommon because uh, these peripheral nerves travel through the body. And uh, so when you have injury to a tissue, it's not uncommon to also have involvement of a peripheral nerve. How will somebody know it's important to come and see someone like you? Well, you know, obviously if, if you uh, cut yourself, you have a laceration or some sort of wound and you notice that you have some numbness or some weakness, that would be highly suggestive that uh, you may have a peripheral nerve injury, in which case I would recommend seeking treatment both for the wound and for those uh, specific symptoms. Would there be a certain time period that somebody should wait and see whether things get better and then come to see you, or would it be a good idea to come see you right away? That's a fantastic question. Um, the timing of intervention is really critical, and that's where we uh, you know, kind of think a lot and debate amongst each other, actually, as a, as a subspecialty. Uh, you know, there, there's often this period of watchful waiting where uh, some peripheral nerve injuries will spontaneously recover. For instance, if it just happens to be a stretch injury and not a complete laceration. And so we usually, if we're not sure if the nerve is in continuity or not, we'll have a period of watchful waiting. But you don't want to wait too long because 
when a muscle or an end organ is not receiving nerve supply and input from the peripheral nervous system, it'll actually atrophy and that atrophy is irreversible. So we're trying to find that sweet spot where we've given the nerve enough time to recover but not too much time that it's too late to intervene. And is there an average period of time that that would actually entail? Uh, most people uh, would uh, intervene somewhere between three months and nine months. Now obviously if you know that the nerve is completely severed then you're going to go in and, and uh, intervene in an, in an acute fashion. So I'm really uh, discussing more specifically stretch injuries or injuries where you're not really sure the extent of the injury. And that's very common with brachial plexus injuries, which is uh, kind of a subtype within the uh, spectrum of peripheral nerve injuries. So the brachial plexus, of course, is that bunch of nerves that sort of run underneath our armpit and then go out to our hands and our arms and all that, right? It, exactly. So if you think about the peripheral nervous system as a tree, those are really the big tree trunks that are coming out of the spinal cord. And then they keep branching and branching and branching further. But, you know, one of the issues with the peripheral, with the brachial plexus in specific, is that each of those tree trunks will eventually branch out to supply a very large area. So if you, uh, if you were to injure one or two or, you know, God forbid, all five of those tree trunks, those main um, uh, divisions coming out of your spinal cord that make up the brachial plexus, it can really have devastating consequences. And it's not uncommon for patients to show up with complete paralysis and numbness of their upper extremity. Let's talk about the repair. Yeah, so, you know, there's been a lot of development over the uh, past decades, and uh, one of the most exciting developments um, and uh, that I think is really facilitating uh, better outcomes is the use of nerve transfers. And what a nerve transfer involves is, is essentially borrowing redundant nerve supply from a place that you have it and rerouting it to the place that you're missing it. And it's pretty amazing that when you do that, the brain can actually reprogram itself such that these inputs that were once going somewhere else will actually be integrated into this new distribution. And over time with training and, um, and practice, these patients can learn to, use, to basically incorporate this new wiring that we give them uh, to have pretty natural motion and sensation. Uh, so I'm hoping that you can help me to understand this just a little bit better. Are you saying that the nerve supply to, let's say, one part of my arm could be transplanted to another part of my arm and that I could train my brain to make it function there? Yes, yes, exactly. Let me give you a, um, a more uh, specific example. So, you know, there are two nerves that, um, two main nerves that uh, go to supply the muscles that flex the elbow going to the biceps and the brachialis, and they come off of the musculocutaneous nerve. And uh, you really only need one of those two uh, muscles to be able to flex your elbow. And so let's say now you're missing function in your hand that you really need. You can borrow one of those two nerves um, and send that down towards the hand, and then those axons will slowly regenerate at about a millimeter a day, and then they'll go and re or find a new uh, muscle to supply in the hand, and then the brain will reprogram itself to use that nerve that was once flexing the elbow to now use the hand. This sounds pretty complicated. Is this a long surgery to accomplish this? Um, you know, the, the surgeries are often uh, long, uh, often because we're doing multiple nerve transfers at a time. You know, I guess this would be a good chance to highlight the fact that I work with a neurosurgeon named Alan Beltsberg and he is a expert in peripheral nerve surgery as well. He's dedicated his uh, long career to peripheral nerve surgery, and um, he shares my passion in peripheral nerve surgery. And so we team up on these cases, which makes them uh, go faster, and I think it allows us to get better outcomes because, you know, while there's a lot of uh, overlap in terms of our specific areas of expertise, um, we also bring different things to the table since we come from different training backgrounds. And I think that ultimately benefits the patient. And uh, it, I think that's one of the strengths of our program here at Johns Hopkins is that we have a true uh, multidisciplinary approach to treating these problems. Talk to me about outcomes since you brought that up. What can people expect once they've had this kind of surgery? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, kind of trying to frame the expectations for patients before we go into surgery is incredibly important. Uh, you know, you can imagine a patient, like I mentioned, who has complete paralysis of their upper extremity. And uh, we, you know, unfortunately, we're not able to restore normal function to all the different muscle groups. And what we're trying to do is just restore some extent of meaningful recovery. And so we talk to the patient about uh, their goals and we tell them about, in our experience, these are the most important functions to try to restore. And, uh, you know, we're not trying to go for full strength and concert pianist abilities. We're just trying to give them some meaningful um, restoration of function so that they can perform their activities of daily living. And we, you know, one of the expressions we like to use is that a little bit goes a long way for these types of scenarios. You mentioned before that you're interested not only in peripheral nerves, but also in injuries to the spinal cord. Can you tell me a little more about that? Yes, I'm glad you asked. That's actually a very exciting cutting edge uh, field that uh, we at Johns Hopkins are, are part of the uh, leading edge on. And, um, you know, I discussed with you the use of nerve transfers for peripheral nerve injuries. We can actually uh, repurpose those for the treatment of specific types of spinal cord injuries. So uh, when you have a spinal cord injury, typically uh, the function below that level of injury is lost, but you have restoration of function above that level of injury. So if you have a uh, spinal cord injury at the uh, level of, let's say, the mid-brachial plexus, then you can almost treat that like a brachial plexus injury where you can reroute those uh, nerves from above the level of injury where they're still functioning to below the level of injury where they're needed. And uh, the spinal cord will not regenerate, whereas the uh, peripheral nerve uh, system will regenerate. And so we're basically uh, taking advantage of the ability of the peripheral nerve uh, system to regenerate to address these spinal cord injuries. How often would that kind of thing be called for? And are there anatomic limits to that? If let's say I have a spinal cord injury so that my legs aren't working well, could I use nerves that are in my upper part of my body for that? That's a great question. You know, we, we haven't really uh, uh, been able to address that specific scenario. I, I would say the ideal scenario would be a patient who has some uh, some upper extremity function and loss of uh, other parts of their upper extremity function. And uh, those are the best uh, patient, um, patients in terms of our ability to use these nerve transfers to um, restore function. And would these actually work if the spinal cord was completely severed at a certain level? Yeah, absolutely. Because above that level of injury, the spinal cord is still intact and it's still sending signals to the peripheral nervous system. And so again, you're gonna have redundant nerves uh, with multiple nerves supplying functioning muscles that you can reroute towards uh, areas that were now not functioning because they were supplied by the spinal cord level and peripheral nerves below the level of injury. Talk to me a little bit, if you would, about your speculations for the future because it sounds to me like there's a lot going on in the repair of these nerves and it sounds like you're very optimistic about what's possible. Yeah, so you know, I think we can already uh, provide patients with some really uh, great outcomes, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. And uh, at present, we're really uh, relying on the patient's innate capacity to regenerate. And uh, you know, we don't really have any therapies at this point that we can give patients to improve the process of nerve regeneration to make it happen more quickly and more robustly. Uh, but there are some promising uh, candidates that are coming out of the lab. Uh, the lab that I lead in particular is uh, looking at a number of uh, very promising candidates, one of which is currently in clinical trials. And so the, the clinical trial that we're running right now is blinded. So. I can't tell you uh, what the outcomes are as of yet, but we are uh, optimistic that you know this could eventually lead to the first uh, therapy that's clinically indicated for peripheral nerve injuries. And then it could also be given to uh, patients with spinal cord injuries where we do nerve transfers and then we can give them this therapy to make our nerve transfers work better. Is there anything else you'd like to add? You know, Elizabeth, I just wanted to really highlight how how much I enjoy working with these, this patient population. 
know, they come in with such devastating injuries and it's really a longitudinal relationship where we first start to talk about their injury and expectations. And then we go through the surgery process and we spend a lot of time together afterwards, kind of through the whole recovery process and rehab. And it's just so uh, incredible to see these patients recover their function, their ability to move their extremities and interact with their environment. And uh, I think that's really what makes it all worthwhile for me. And um, you know, I just uh, wanted to highlight how, how much I enjoy working with this patient population and how that's really kind of what we focus on with these um, scenarios. Well, thank you so very much for that. And thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. I really enjoyed the conversation and it was a pleasure.